Hi and welcome to another episode of Coffee with Mirko. I'm very happy that you're here and I hope you're safe wherever you are. And if you're from Melbourne, sending you all the love to the baristas uh, who just uh, are back into lockdown and they just have lost their jobs. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making this show possible. And I'm very excited to bring on the our next guests. And uh, yeah, we're just going to have some fun. And here he is, Mr. Wilford. Thank, Thank you, Bruce Shark. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Hey, man. How are you? Fantastic. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Just, uh, I, I suppose, I'm not sure if you're here, but, you know, Melbourne is back into into phase. Yeah, so, but, you know, we're all doing well, man. We're all blessed and grateful for, you know, being here, sharing a cup of coffee <laughs> with, 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 like, with, with you and uh, yeah how about yourself man well here in panama things are uh, pretty bad as well in the capital city things are very very messy and now in the in the highlands where where i am in 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 the coffee farm the region is getting so so uh, some coffee farms has been as have been affected and that's uh that's very complicated for a whole town because it's a very small town yeah and tell us more about that small town in terms of like how is that going to impact everyone around because obviously with the virus i'm assuming that things are slowing down but nature has not slowed down in terms of the trees the cherries yes so well luckily we are right now in the in the final stages of the of the harvest but there is some farmers that are still drying coffee and there are some farmers that are still um, uh, shipping coffee out and as of now in our farm we have a lot of work and, and, and if we get to be uh, on a quarantine mode it's going to be catastrophic for the business side and then you, can, you have to consider the health side of the employees because when you're in a coffee farm you're in a coffee mill there's many people working around each other so if one gets infected then <coughs> several can get infected as well so that part is very catastrophic and we, we are very solid with solid, a lot of solidarity with uh, all of these um, farmers that have been affected with this. And we feel it's a really, really bad news for them. We hope the best because it's, it just gets bad in the, in the health part and also the economical part. Because as you say, you know, the coffees are being dried in a coffee bed and then there's nobody that's going to gonna, gonna fix that. <clears throat> And the entire farm goes, gets in quarantine. It doesn't mean that you can get somebody that was not there when the contagious happened. You are just, you, you just cannot bring anybody in for a, for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're going to touch base on that in, in a minute. Um, speaking of better, better news, uh, Wilford, uh, thank you so much for being here and giving us your time. I know you're, you're super busy. You're spinning. Here you go. Sorry, have you back. I, I lost you for a second. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. Internet connection. No, 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 don't be sorry. Um, well, thank you again for being here. Uh, I know you're a busy man. Um, and if you can tell us all a little bit how you started, how your coffee journey started and your story. Okay, I'm going to go back to my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, he came to Panama to work in the Panama Canal. And then he was working in the Panama Canal. He was a police officer. He was from the United States originally. And because Panama Canal was uh, part of the United States back then, he landed in the, in the U.S. Uh, Panama Canal zone. And then he had a friend. He was a Swedish um, engineer that worked in the Panama Canal. And when they were retiring, when they were close to retirement, they decided to pay a visit to a place that they read about. It was called Boquete. It's the town of Boquete where our coffee farms are right now. So they travel and they fell in love. And a few years later, when they retired, they both got farms next to each other. One's called Elida and the other one's called Lerida. And then they started the coffee business. He married a local lady and then they had five kids. And for one of those five kids is my grandfather who worked his whole life in coffee. 
And then it goes my father. My father is um, part of the group that work in the in the in creating the Special Coffee Association of Panama, which was the first um, partner with the you know, the SCAA back in the day when it was only United States as a producing country. And then they fought, they started doing the coffee competitions and then they started working with the auctions and they started creating this community that helped each other improve the, the quality of the, of, the, of the coffee among each other, trying to go for better quality coffee. And then things started getting better because Panama in the 90s, after the IC, ICA agreement was collapsed, Panama mm -hmm. got Panama got the worst part in the in the region for the for the crisis because Panama was competing against Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, and all these countries that have a lot of productivity in coffee. And Panamanian productivity of coffee is very small, and we have a lot of expensive costs because Panama it's located. Uh, it, sorry, Panama has um, a dollarized economy, and mm -hmm. everything is more expensive to do here. Wages are higher, cost of everything you buy is higher than it is in other countries. Like, for example, if you produce coffee in Colombia, you are working on pesos and everything costs you on pesos. And then once you export it to Europe, you are getting back euros or you export it into the United States, you're getting back dollars. So the money that comes back is a little bit more, more solvent. Uh, so Panama was facing that issue. So there was no other way. These producers in the early 90s, my father and his colleagues, we're doing um, other crops. I remember when I was a kid, my father had uh, onion, onion uh, sweet for, for sweet onions in the farm. And I used to go around the coffee trees that were there, but it was not the main business. It was the onions. Um, coffee was still part of the family the whole time, but the margin was so small. But then globalization came in and onions from Panama were not competitive to the market. Nicaraguans produce a better coffee uh, sorry, a better onion, and at the better cost. So Panama was not competing then. There was a moment where my father was trying to negotiate in with with a Panamanian legislator, and they were in the in, in Washington D.C. trying to negotiate, not allowing imports of onions into the country, so they could still compete. But that was a lost case. And let's say that was about 1994. The legislator that was with my father that day. His grandfather was a coffee producer, and he was originally from New York. His last name was Martins, and they owned a coffee farm called La Florentina. And then they walked into the Starbucks just after a meeting, and they go in the, in the Starbucks. It has a, a wall, and the wall has a, a Panamanian indigenous art where the, they, they create this thing called the mola. It's Panamanian and Colombian. And this traditional art create read in the top La Florentina, Panama. And the guy sees that and he goes nuts. He's like, oh my God, this is my grandfather's farm. Who could have imagined that? In Washington, D.C. Back then it was not like today that you go and watch a really cool coffee bag with the name of the farm. That, that was not the case back then. And then my father just saw that and he's like, wow, this is what we need to aim. We need to start doing farm names. We need to start promoting our own coffees. So he came back to the agricultural um, um, group. The, 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 how do you say groups in English? Like in Spanish, we say gremio. So the, the group of, of farmers. Association? Yeah, like association, yeah. <clears throat> and the group of farmers from uh, different products. And he said, everybody had coffee because that was the main crop from the, from the, from the region. He said, we need to go back into coffee. Coffee, it's our... Is that okay? Yeah. When, when did it stop? Uh, coffee is our... Yeah, so the coffee is, is our, is our um, how do you say the, the, well, it, it, was, it, it was destined to be coffee because all of the great grandfathers and grandfathers did coffee. So they went back into coffee, but this time they were creating the Specialty Coffee Association, trying to aim for more sophisticated markets. And now I <clears> fast <throat> forward the story, and the story goes into then the Best of Panama was created, the Peterson family 
put the Geisha coffee in the best of Panama that blew everybody's mind. It changed the coffee scenery because then it opened up a new door that there was no, more things to explore. And every country got benefited from that, at least in the specialty coffee side. I know that sea market is struggling, but at least in the specialty coffee, it got more open. So that was 2004. In 2004, I was only 14 years old. But I was witnessing all this because it was part of my father's, like my father, all the time, he, everything has to do with coffee. Everything he does. And he even for a while, when, when the crisis was very bad, when he was doing onions and then we was, he was working on aluminum windows. Actually, he was, was selling one of those windows that you see behind me. That was, he, 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 did, he did that for a while because there was not enough money to support a family in coffee. But all the time coffee was part of, his, of him. He, if he needed to go and do some cupping late at night, he will do it. Or he could wake up at 4 a.m., go get ready, be cupping some coffee at 5 a.m. so he can be at the office at 7 a.m. doing the, the, the window thing. So all the time it was part of him. And, and we, I can witness it. I can sense it. And I went to university in the United States. Then I came back. And when I came back, I was doing a part-time job at the beginning. And then I realized that coffee was my calling because funny story, silly and funny story. I got a Facebook account with a picture of me, myself, my sister, and my, my father, my, the whole family. We are two, two siblings, my mom and dad. And the picture was an old picture when I was a baby and my sister was a baby. And you could see my father and my mother, younger, and people will add me on Facebook and start talking to me, to me about coffee. And my father had no Facebook back then. And I was like, there's so much people happy for the product that my father is producing. And I'm receiving these messages just for having the same name he has. Now I go by Junior because now we are both working in the same industry. And I, in, the, in that moment, he called me and I'm like, I need to go into coffee. This is what yeah. I need to do. Back then, things were not as good. But I asked my father, can I work here? And he's like, you got to earn. You're not going to earn too much money at the beginning. But. I, I would love to, of course. It's, this is your family, family's business. So I did. And then little after that, my grandfather started getting a little bit older. So he was not able to work in the farm as he used to. And my father had a... So I started working in coffee about early 2013. And in late 2013, my father was diagnosed with, with, with a rare case of cancer. So he, oh, he was not able sorry, to be treated... Dude. He, he's well now. He was not able to be treated in Panama, so he Good had day. to move to the United States for uh, about eight months. So that's like that was the moment where I stepped up and started doing everything possible to learn and 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 be part of this industry. And that 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 was the that was the way I I began with coffee. And then I was I was inspired to do the 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 coffee shop and roastery in Panama, even though the, the market is small here, it's still very small. So I pioneered in that. I opened the first first uh, third wave roastery and coffee shop in the whole city of Panama. And a very small shop, it's still very small, but it was very rewarding to see the people in Panama, not only the Panamanian people that live in Panama, but also the people that come and, and travel to, to for other tourism to be able to try coffee that was produced for export quality. That was a very uh, gratifying thing. And so I became a barista, roaster, and also a coffee producer. And I kind of, as of today, I kind of only talk about coffee all the time. <laughs> but, but that's fantastic. I think uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's such a romantic side to it <clears throat> in the sense of it's your heritage, it's your land, it's your roots. It's exactly the same soil or land that you grew up, you know, yeah. to. So often coffee finds people uh, in terms of baristas and coffee roasters, you know, they were studying, they were going through different parts of life, and then eventually they bump into coffee by coincidence, by chance. In this case, you were born into coffee. Even, you know, if, onions, even if onions were the main business, like, 
those coffee trays were there, those chairs were there. Like it, it's something so tangible that you, you could touch it, you could dream of it. It, it. You know, you look outside the window and you probably see coffee. So yeah. it's a, such a strong part uh, and identity. I think I think that's the word I was looking for. It's part of your identity. Yes. So one thing that for. For us as a community of agricultural community, most of the people in this town is uh, in, into agriculture. We have um, we have a lot of passion for, for for what we do as coffee growers, but there is a there is a passion that we acquired once we started connecting with this side that you just mentioned. People like you, people mm -hmm. that is in love with coffee, roasters, baristas, even home home enthusiasts that is big in many countries, especially in the Asian countries. When you once you travel to, um, to, to, to these conventions and you see these competitions, and you see these people that are in love with the coffee and then they talk about the Ethiopian they had last, year, last week and then they talk about the Colombian they're getting this week and that roaster and the other roaster and that passion gets contagious and you brought you bring back that to the to, to but when you come back to the farm after a convention and then somebody else's travel and it's just a completely inspirational sense that you get into this industry that then it becomes something completely different then you are not a traditional agriculture but you are something else so what one friend that doesn't even drink coffee a friend of mine that is in uh, energy his his business is energy he said to me The thing that you guys have is that the way you produce coffee and market it is like an art. So you guys are like artists. And, 100%. Um, and, and then I, I started thinking about that. And I'm like, wow, that, that can be so true. And there's moments like in coffee, of course, everybody wants to be well fed and everybody wants to be safe economically. But during the year, you're thinking about impressing yourself with the quality of the coffee you can reach. You are not thinking about how much money I can make by this. And then if you do things right, it can be rewarding, but it's not what drives us. And I think that's part of the success. And I don't mean only us, my father, myself, and our team. I mean it with, with our colleagues in town, because in here, there's a lot of unity. People here in Panama, we work with each other, and that's why we achieve this level of success because everybody else was able to, to help each other improve. Yeah, and I, I think that's where our job comes important when it comes to, you know, people who serve your coffees, coffee from everyone, you know, because coffee is such a chain of people, right? Uh, pickers, farmers like yourself, exporters, importers, roaster, um, And all the way to the person who grabbed that cup of coffee and drinks it. But, you know, peoples are made out of stories, connections, narratives. And it's important that in order for people to understand better what's behind the cup, it's also important to translate that story. I mean, what you share with us is so powerful, right? It's like your great grandfather, you know, fell in love with the land. I, I can picture it. The way you were talking about it, I could picture it, you know, I'm like, you know, this beautiful scenery uh, in such a beautiful, pristine part of the world. And all of a sudden, he decided, you know what, I want to live here. So he, he made his dream come true already. And then, you know, it's like wine. I think wine, the wine industry tells stories a little bit better sometimes than us because we really appreciate the vintage, the, the you know, the, the, the harvest from 19 yeah, and some yeah, what. Yeah. And the exactly. soil becomes part of the story because it's like, hey, this soil has seen hundreds of generations and, the, you know, the grapes have been here for this many years and, uh, and the stories are made by the people behind that coffee. Uh, so I think it's important for coffee farmers to connect for coffee roasters to connect even more with farmers to be able to get a good understanding of the stories, forget a little bit about money, focus on the story, and be able to translate the story to the end consumer. You know, the, now that we're talking about this, the story, it's 
told by the wine industry a little bit better. There, there are factors that I think of. W one thing is that wine countries are normally uh, first world countries. And you have France, Spain, you have the United States, then you have Australia, and you have Italy. And then if you go down south, you, you have uh, Chile, for example, which is a Latin American country, but it's a Latin American country that is better established than, than, than Central American company, com, uh, countries, and especially the coffee producing countries. But especially coffee countries, the, 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 con, the countries that produce specialty coffee or coffee, It's getting bad. I can move. Hang on. I think it's picking up back again. I, I am. No, no, we got you. Here we okay, go. Okay, I move a little bit. So yeah, the, okay, the specialty coffee, the specialty coffee countries are countries that struggles economically. You were saying. Yeah. So things like that, I think, affect because we have. Um, so, so for, for many, many farmers, it's harder to have a voice, not because the roasters don't want it, but it's, it, you know, people is trying to make a living, people is trying to, to export the coffee as soon as possible, trying to make the, be the, the, the best possible uh, sale, and things like that. It's not like the same marketing that you get in wine. And then you have um, in, the, in, the, in the coffee industry, you will have a, um, what did I say? Like a little bit of a disconnection because sometimes the roasters are doing part of the job and then the roasters are closer to the storytellers. And I'm gonna, uh, I mentioned a few, a few things. <clears throat> For example, one thing that wine gets, like, I don't know if you know this, but uh, in a few years we got uh, big in the news, our coffee because we got an auction coffee sold and then the cup of coffee was sold in the United States. So they, there was a, a list of things, a list of things in, in, in Yahoo, I think Yahoo Finance or something. And the list mentioned a bunch of cool, expensive stuff. Some of them were food, some of them were uh, material stuff. And then you had a very deep, interesting explanation about each one of them. And then you go into read, you read about the wine. The wine was about half a million dollars, or a little bit more than half a million dollars, a French wine. And then you read about the wine bottle, and the wine bottle mentioned so many cool things about the terroir, the family, the country, the region. And then you go into the coffee thing, and just it just says, wow, like you could imagine a cup of joe being sold at this price. And then I'm like, they don't understand that coffee can also be explained the same way as wine. They don't understand that this, this is not a magical thing. There's a lot of things behind this, not only from the man part, like the people that got the coffee to that price, but the, the soil itself, like nature. And things like that are, um, are the things that are getting disconnected. Yeah. And then that, that, that's, that's what I. That's what I, I. I feel that we we can fix them. But people like people like you that you want to do a life. You want to do a story of life with people from different parts of the of the industry, from roasters, from baristas, from producers, people all over the world. Things like that helps helps a lot because then you're you're helping tell the story. Yeah, but the story wouldn't be possible without you. So let's say thank you first. <laughs> <laughs> now I appreciate what you're saying. Look, you're right, and uh, I think I think also we are a few years behind uh, wine in terms of sto on the storyline, and because wine, the way we drink coffee now in the third wave, uh, we started just recently compared to the way that we've been drinking yeah. wine for so many years. Uh, the other part that I was discussing with Matteo Teis, because uh, he's in search of the perfect cup of coffee. Uh, and, you know, he made a good point about wine. Wine is going to taste the same no matter who opens the bottle, how they open the bottle, which country they're going to open the bottle. Once it's in the bottle, 
you've got a pretty clear understanding of what that's going to taste like. Um, unless it's cork and, I don't know, the shipment yeah. didn't go well. But most times, yeah, because I used to be the one industry, so I get it. With coffee, there's so many components. I don't need to explain it to you, but for the viewers and the people going to listen again, you know, you go water, the person who does it, how old is the coffee, when did the coffee was roasted, how the coffee was roasted, and a hundred more elements that be- makes it slightly more difficult. I think our job is to just keep doing what we're doing and tell the story. And once the more stories we tell, the bigger the book gets and the more people will put value to that book. And uh, it's a book made out of humans and people, right? Going back to that. And I think that in coffee, we're even more of a people industry compared to wine. Uh, not Nothing against wine, but it's just incredible how coffee brings people together on so many levels from different jobs all the way to different processes, you know, in between, you know, from cherry to, no, you, you know what, forget cherry, from the first three planted yes, all the way to a, I don't know, uh, iced cappuccino, frappuccino with two shots, mm-hmm. with two sugar, it doesn't matter what it is. There's so many people in the chain, um, and yet coffee brings us together as far as sharing a cup of coffee together. And, and then that's where the stories need to come to uh, life. Um, and in terms of your achievements, um, and then we get into the out-of-the-box question because we're at the halfway mark. But in terms of your achievements, we have a, how proud were you when you uh, won those amazing titles? Well, you know, I, I, I look, th- this is a moment where I, I have, um, like, the most coverage and the most uh, recent awards are the ones that, that get the more attention because of something that I am not necessarily think that is the best thing, the, the price of the auction, it gets the more attention because it gets the more clicks. But at the end of the day, that's not the best part. The best part is the moment you win with the coffee and get the higher points in the competition history. And that's like, wow. So this means that this coffee got the higher points in all the years of history of doing this competition. And that's for me the most rewarding part. But there's a moment very symbolic for me. And there's a moment where we were, as a family, we we had a lot of struggles as a family due to coffee crisis. And then the, the, the window thing that I told you was not as uh, as, as flourishing. Uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of struggle in our family, and then my father was always in front, fighting hard and hard and hard. And then one, in a moment, he gets the cancer that I mentioned before. That was in late 2013. He needs to go to the United States, and then there was a moment, and then I step in into the coffee industry. And then uh, there's a moment. And in the in the in between of that, uh, my grandmother died. She was old, but yeah, it was a, a sad moment. And Sorry to hear that. Yeah, my my uncle, my father's brother, who was younger than my father, he passed away recently when my father was um when my father was doing treatment. So it was very confusing. People even thought they were mentioning the wrong brother because nobody was expecting that guy to to pass away. Mm-hmm. And then after all the struggles. There's a moment that is symbolic to me that is the 2015 Best of Panama where we didn't get any first places, but between the traditional categories and the geisha categories, we were able to win the Panama Cup because of accumulation of points. In that moment, my sister's graduation was the same day. So my father was in my sister's graduation and I was in the Best of Panama. And parallel to that, my father was able to feel through his son the achievement of his success in, in his professional part being received that moment. And then at the same time, he had his daughter being graduated from the university. So it was like, like you know, like, like, a, ha- like a happy ending. And, 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 and there was a, a really symbolic moment for me and my family. And then a few years Beautiful. back to that, we, we get to have the, the impressive because the, in, Pan- in the best of Panama is different from the Cup of Excellence. Cup of Excellence only score one category. We have four categories. We have the traditionals, which is either processed or um, washed. And we have the geisha, which is either processed or washed. And we were able to win both geisha categories. 
back to back years. Nobody ever won one geisha category, uh, both geisha categories the same year, but we were able to do it not only once, but twice. In that moment, the exciting, I, I think you should go to our highlight, uh, my highlights on my Instagram or the La Masa Family Estates Instagram and see the, the excitement we had. The camera was recording my father. He didn't record me. I was uh, uh, the same excited, but his reaction is so natural. That moment was like, this is it. This is, this is what of we've course. been working our whole lives for. Well, of course, because I mean, and like you mentioned, and something that it's very close to me, you know, it's not about money. Like that, that emotional attachment had to do with the sweat, tears, blood, sacrifices, uh, long days, early mornings, uh, you know, like hard work. Like being a farmer is not that fancy. It's not a nine to five. It's uh, you work with and against nature. You work with and against different situations across the economy of coffee. And that was more, you know, such a important moment, not in a business relevant way. It was more like, okay, finally my hard work has been recognized. There's, there's actually a title to it, which is fantastic. And I love it. And I'm going to rewatch the high slides. Uh, Wilford, we already uh, reached the halfway mark and I always ask this out of the box question. Um, if you could, who would you like to have dinner with? Doesn't have to be coffee, whoever you want. Wow. You know, Gary V. Have you heard about Gary V? Oh, yeah. I heard that. With, with I him. know. Yeah, with him. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Someone asked me that question um, during the live stream. Uh, a viewer asked that question while we we're waiting for a guest. And I just answered the same. So uh, you're the first one who says, yeah, we'll name him. Yeah, I get you. I wish I, wish I can have a dinner with him. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, I, 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 something that I like, I, I don't know if he understands about coffee industry, but I know that if he gets to it, he's going to love it. He's going to love the whole thing, how it's being done. And especially because he's from wine. And, and yeah, and the, the, whole, the whole thing connects. And it's, and not, it's not only for that reason that I admire him, but yeah, that, that's something good. And, and speaking of which, um, he actually just recently sold at a record high his wine company to the biggest uh, uh, to the biggest buyer of wine company in the world. He just sold Empathy Wines, I think, five or six days ago. Wow, that, I had no idea about that. That's a great news. So yeah, yeah, have a have a look. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, yes, and I think that's always a good answer because it brings it back to that family connection right yeah because that that, that, that was, was the same father story. correct yeah. and again situation father immigrant and came to yeah. give a better life to to his children from belarus and that's you know there's a connection to to your story so i think it's important to value family uh, more than anything um and aside from the coffee you also are a damn good, you know, brewer. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I get to have, I, I had some success on that, yeah. I'm looking forward, I was looking forward to go to Melbourne. That was, it was my first time to go to that uh, country that I heard so many good things about. And unfortunately, I think it's not gonna be possible to do it in Melbourne this year. I think Melbourne's gonna become the, probably a future competition. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, what they are going to do is they're going to just send us to the next one, which, which was supposed to be Athens. And then Melbourne is going to be uh, assigned for the next one for the new group of cha national champions to go to. Maybe I can mm -hmm. try to make my way out to that one as well. But well, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you will. A little bit disappointing, yeah. Actually, yeah. That's, the way, that's the way I found out about the Melbourne thing because my father sent it to me just making me read about because, yeah, of course, we were not expecting. Now, at this moment, we have no expectations. Like, travel expectations and, 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 and like, every, everything today is day by day. And everything we are doing a day by day. And then the, the thing, the, the news was sent to me, like, hey, here, a little bit reading about what's going on in Melbourne right now. But I am not expecting Melbourne anytime soon for the competition. Yeah, yeah. and... and 
I think it's, I mean, I was looking forward to have the world versus the champion here because obviously I'm here, so it would have been easy. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Look, Maybe not this, will. This, will. This, this next one, but the, the one after that. Yeah, it will. Um, and look, just because you, just based on your answer, actually, because uh, it's probably a concept that you have heard several times, uh, how important is for you to value your happiness in what you do rather than money? Because let's be honest, if you start a growing commercial coffee and start selling more commercial coffee, your margins are higher, you will make more money, there will be higher demand. There's, no, there's nothing to hide from it. So, but how important is to put at the forefront your happiness? I think that's a really good question. Uh, and it's a real one from what's happening right now. So we, when, when we started winning these competitions, a lot of business um, propositions have come uh, in coffee, uh, but mostly are things that are not necessarily what we do and what we love to do. And we think about the opportunities business-wise, but then we think to ourselves, is it going to be make us happy? Is it going to, is it going to be, as, is, are we going to put the same passion we are to do what we do right now? And then, well, I, I can like I can speak from a privileged standpoint because I am not struggling economically. We are not rich people, but we are we are doing okay. We are doing economically good. And then maybe the answer is easier that way than if I was in another situation. But it's not about making more money if it's not gonna make us happy. Because what we are, the way the reason why we are successful in the coffee industry is because for us. It's just so passion. Actually, Gary Vee said it a few times ago. If you're going to do something new, do the thing that you have the most passion for and the thing you know the best. And those, I have the most passion for coffee and I do it the best. So it's a perfect combination. Why should I be doing something else? And I'm not talking about something outside of coffee, but it's that part of the coffee, like the farming third wave style that I do. Some people want us to work on bigger projects that are more commercial-wise, you know, more corporate-wise that have to do with coffee, but it's not the same. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, mm, I think it's not gonna make us happy. So it's not gonna be probably we're not gonna we're not gonna give the same result as we are doing here because it's not making us happy. Yeah, and and I think chasing that happiness it's so key in so many aspects, even on a health point of view, right? And. Yeah then you do the things you gotta do as far as surviving and you're looking at your father those four o'clock in the morning wake up at four yeah. o'clock and working for, for the window business uh, that that is you know what what people need to do and if people need to you know i think that to that thing that you just say when my father was working in the window business and he had the he, he has his, his can he had the cancer he came back and in the moment he came back he was only 100% in coffee. The moment he started doing that, you could see that his health was even better than even before. So it's completely like the happiness of being in what he loves brought him back completely. Not, not to the, how he was, he was before, but to even a better moment when, that he was before. It's perspective, right? Because all of a sudden... Uh, you know, he was he was faced with such a challenging, unknown situation that none of us would like to be in it. Okay, and all of a sudden, when those moments happen, you really understand what really is important. Is it important to have four jobs to make more money? Is it important to start making commercial coffee to make more money, or is it important to you know? go to your sister's graduation whilst you're winning Best of Panama. And all let, of a sudden, me, it puts things in perspective. Let me tell you something now that Todd Goldsworthy wrote a comment here. When I was, one time I was uh, in one of the coffee conventions and he was competing for the U.S. national competition. And Todd and, and Mike, uh, the roaster for, for, for his company, the one who had roast his coffee, they invited my father and myself to taste with him previous to competition to discuss the scriptures. And I was in the backstage watching the whole thing, watching him prepared, watching him being coached, watching the rest of the competitors being prepared. And that was the inspiration for me to start doing Brewers Cup. It was because of Todd. 
There you go. Thanks, Todd, for dropping that comment. That <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. And um, we should bring him on uh, on this live stream too. I might reach out to him later. Um, well, talking, bringing it back a little bit on on what we started with the virus. Um, I like to have the chance to talk to you because it's so direct to a very more mysterious part of the coffee world, which is farms. We, you know, we don't have, we often see the baristas, the latte art, but we rarely see farmers and we rarely hear from farmers as far as the macro uh, community goes. Um, what does the virus mean and how can people watching or listening or re-listening to this can help to support specialty coffee farmers uh, that might have containers of coffee that are sitting in the port or are sitting in the farm? Those are very difficult things to answer. Right now we have, uh, like, people need to start buying the, the, the product that is done by the, the roasters that are buying direct, not the big corporations. And then everybody that is in any situation in this COVID right now, everybody have access to essentials. And coffee can because it's, it's part of the essential. People need to try to buy the coffee from those roasters and not buy it at the supermarket where coffee is going to be sold by a company that is probably uh, not necessarily doing everything uh, in, in a equally for the producer. They try to buy as much as product of, for coffee for the people that do the ethical part because that way you're helping that company and that company will be be able to buy more coffee. You know, there are many companies in the United States and the world that are just struggling and they are, they are still committing to buy the coffee because they know how important it is and that they are going to struggle, but that the producer is going to struggle even more. But on the other side, there are a lot that are not. And the, the, whole, the whole situation is very tough uh, for any produ coffee producer. And right now, I think that the best way to do it is just to buy, making sure that you are buying from the ones that are buying the product directly and not necessarily buying from the bigger companies that, you know, so that's the only thing I can I can think of because right now the, the situation is hitting everybody. Right now in the coffee community, in the coffee uh, producing world, we have a, we, recently we have a disease of a, of a friend of all of us, uh, he, a guy that was young. He was not an old guy. Like he, he was very healthy and, and things like this, like in a coffee farm, you're isolated to a point. But once somebody from the team gets it, ju you're just in a very, very risky situation. Yeah. And that's happening in, in, in several countries. Now, Panama, I can say that Panama had very, very bad situation, but at least it's reporting because our other co fellow uh, countries that are in the, in the coffee industry surrounding us, they're not even reporting the, the numbers. And that's even scarier. Yeah, it is. Uh, also... I think it's important to mention, you know, there's a responsibility with, um, you know, within the consumers. However, I also like to point out something that I've, I I love that Tim Wendelbo told me during an interview, which I think is very important going back to people, going back to connections. You know, he was telling me how he always buys the same coffee from the same uh, coffee farms and they just pretty much became family. And now during the virus situation, uh, it's much e it's easier, even though there's an emotional attachment, even though it's a business transaction, but that connection, that relationship is far more valuable than many other aspects. And we kind of touched base on that earlier on in the, in the chat. I think, I think we also need to create more and more relationship, direct relationships to help each other out. And uh, I just love that concept, the idea of roasters to be more and more connected to the farmers on a consistent level year after year after year. I can, I can add something to, look, there's many people in the, in the, in the consumer side uh, that are very worried about the whole coffee situation. And it's, 
it's okay to be worried about the COVID situation. And people ask me like, what I should do to help. And then <clears throat> I have to remind everybody to change an entire industry that is so big, like the number two consumed uh, liquid in the world. The second commodity, the second most consumed commodity in the world. The, to change it, it's going to take a while. And we have, to, we have to understand that people that are in a bar, in a coffee bar, and they are willing to tell a customer that the coffee comes from a specific region, and the reason why it's going to taste that way is because of that, that's a big step towards helping. And because it's very new, the whole third wave thing, the whole passion barista, talking about the coffee, putting the coffee first, those things are very new. But those things are, the more they replicate, the more we are getting closer to, to, to help this entire industry. Because as, as of now, specialty coffee, of course, you see these coffees that are super expensive. You have these geisha coffees, but they're so, just a small sample. Then you have the specialty coffee that are extremely great coffees that are being sold green uh, from, the, from, the, from the farmers at $2.50, $2.70. And those prices are very, very, very low to be considered the, the, the top tier, you know, the specialty part. How much are you expecting for people to pay for C market prices is, if people is only paying two and so cents for a specialty coffee? And then I think that the more value you add to specialty coffee, the more it's going to pull up everything else. And people is going to understand. As of now, if you go around, like maybe in Melbourne, it's a little bit different because Melbourne is such a cool city in coffee, in, in, in the coffee scenery. But in most cities in the world, you will find extremely great coffee shops and roasteries. But block by block, it's not going to be the case. It's going to be a different case. And the more people that are willing to risk opening a roastery or the more baristas that are willing to work because they love it, that's going to help. And more people are going to know. You stand up yeah. in line just wanting to ask for something to be caffeinated. And then you go, you, you go out of the shop and you just got something to caffeinate you. There's not, there's not big help there. But if you go there just to want to be caffeinated and the barista tells you a few key points that are interesting, even if you don't buy at that moment or even if you don't even drink coffee, you're going to talk about it and it's going to get to people and that's going to help open up more the, the knowledge in people because the big part of helping this community is create awareness in the consumer because the consumers that pay little money is not because they want to it's not they want because they want the, the wars for the producers it's because they don't understand that what's happening once they get awareness people is going to be willing to do a little extra effort for a great product not only in quality but in ethical uh, practices I agree with you, and to add to that, because you mentioned Melbourne, I also believe it's important in cities who take more and more the approach of third wave uh, type of coffee to remember the overall mission. Uh, the over the, the big the big battle it's not against each other, you know, because I see a lot of because I used to work for Coffee Rosta, and you know there is certain behaviors when it comes to business and wholesale, and it's like. Me against you, you know, because you sell a blend for twenty seven fifty a kilo, then I'm gonna go in at twenty six thirty and I'm gonna also give them a machine. So there's a lot of competition, um and there's a lot of different things that when I was in it I was like, Oh uh, it's okay. I I understand it but I don't like it in the terms of the big battle is not against each other, it's against the big guys. It's against and and again it's not against. I don't wanna sound negative and, and um against it's a strong word but the battle is more towards uh that one dollar cup of coffee sold at coffee chain fast foods uh because those are the ones that are keeping you know the demand higher for commodity coffee therefore the price just plummets now so yeah 100 percent. and sorry you know just quickly tommy asking yeah. if do you ride a bike uh, I don't, Tommy, but do you ride a bike, Wilford? No, I don't. Actually, okay. I, I would love to. I don't know why I don't do it, but I don't ride a bike. I haven't for a while. <laughs> yeah. When I, was um, very young, when I was very young, I got hit in my, in my head very, very, very bad. 
And since then, I just, I, I've done it, but I don't do it as much because I got kind of traumatic, tra traumatized by that. And sorry, yeah. So basically, yeah, I think the, the real battle is a different one. Instead of going against each other, we need to uni, unite and work together for the bigger battle. The bigger battle is the, against the ignorance because that ignorance is what creates these companies to be able to buy the coffee that way. Because if those companies realize that the market is looking for something different, then they're going to they're, they're going to need to start doing it that way. So yes. once we create awareness and we are doing it, a, a podcast, a, a magazine article, a live, a, just a post creates awareness. So little by little, it's being... 100%. Yeah, and, and social media is also a new thing. So this is part of this. And to add to the, you know, I always talk with my friends about different topics, where is environment, where is a different type of lifestyle or diet. And a lot of times we point fingers at the government or at the bigger scale kind of uh, operations. Yeah, we forget that. Fortunately or unfortunately, we live in such a consumeristic world. Therefore, the consumer has actually more power than they believe because the consumer behavior is what originates and drafts the markets, demand, supply. You know, so, you know, whether it's the environment that you care about, whether it's the animals that you care about, whether it's the coffee farmers that you care about, each individual's action determine the bigger picture anyway that's a big thought for another a whole new podcast because that's a big big can of worms but Wilford thank you so much for popping by I usually say my thank you a few minutes before he ends because Instagram is really it just chops it um, thank you I think it was great to hear from you directly from origin giving the voice to the farmers that deserve the voice to have the voice because without you, we wouldn't have the beautiful coffee that we can drink and enjoy in Melbourne, in Sydney, in London, in Milan, wherever yes. it is. Thank you for coming. Super, super grateful to have you on. And one of the last questions I always ask at the end is, so what's next on your planet? Well, my, my next step, right now, we are waiting for Best of Panama. Mm. The difference is here is that we are not getting a Best of Panama presence, so we are going to send samples to several different countries, including uh, Australia, and we are going to hope for the best. Right now, we have a little bit of the consistency with the water, with the aqua cold water, but at the same time, we have um, we don't have the same consistency with the with the roasting. So everybody's going to roast differently in every country. We're going to try to send the cars. So that's what we are waiting for, the results for the Best of Panama 2020, which got delayed because of the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it got delayed and changed the format. And then after that, this competition. But I don't know when this competition is going to happen, the, the, the Barista Brewers comp competition. So right now we are trying to, to, to finish with uh, our production for the year and expect the best for the Best of Panama, not only for us, but the, for the whole country, that the copies can get well copped and all those things that will be challenging due to the situation that we are living now. Mm -hmm. And in terms of macro dreams, as far as what would you like to see uh, for yourself, for the coffee community in the coming years? You know what I want to, I want to win the Brewers Cup champion. I want to be the world Brewers Cup champion because I've, I've realized that in the, in the, in the industry of coffee, there is a disconnection sometimes between if you are a producer and you are um, and you are uh, uh, a coffee barista, and I tell you, sorry, one uh, actually you spoke about Matthew Thies before. Matthew and I we shared the same apartment in Boston because we were being coached by the same guy by Ben Putt. So I knew about him and I knew about uh, Emmy, of course. Emmy was the the current champion back then, and but I ne never met them before. So they stayed at the apartment that I stayed in. And in that apartment, I had a, a picture, a, a few pictures of, my presentation was about the people that got the coffee to be possible, but going back. Like I spoke about the guy that brought the first seed to, to, to Panama from, from the Gesha variety. I spoke about the Peterson family that were the ones that, that showed it to the world. 
And I spoke about uh, Joseph Brodsky, that was the guy that started implementing the, the natural processes in Panama. And then I spoke about my father and the whole team that were the ones that make it, made it possible. That was my, my presentation about it. And then he was looking at the pictures and the only guy that he recognized was Joseph because Joseph is more of a, like, he's like a promoter of coffee. He was more involved in competition scenery and around, but the rest he wasn't, uh, he, he had no idea who the Peterson family was, who, in my opinion, not in my opinion, I think based on, 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 the, on the results, they've done the biggest discovery in, in, the, in the coffee, specialty coffee industry by putting the geisha coffee in the in the in the in the best of panama and help broke a glass ceiling that opened up the best for the specialty coffee in a competitor that is a big big guy in coffee I had no idea about that and then i i realized that just as in, in we have one part of the coffee industry knowledgeable about us but there's a big one that is not. And I think if I am able to be the first producer, first, first guy from, uh, from origin to win one of these big coffee competitions, not the copying one, because they don't put the most attention into that one, but Brewers and Barista are the top top ones. I can have a new voice that will be helpful for the producers in order to try to say, hey, let's start working deeper into the producers let's start doing more into the farms let's go direct because sometimes buyers are confused on the best practices sometimes there are uh local uh locals that have a company that just a central meal for this and and and, and because he's from let's say from panama i'm not saying any anybody from panama but some oh the guy is from panama so i'm buying coffee from directly probably not Probably that guy is ripping off the, the, the producers that doesn't even know how to speak English and you're taking advantage of that. And Whoa. those things happen a lot. And, and it's very hard for the consumer countries to realize that. And I think that if I win these competitions, I have a new voice that will be a part of a voice from all the producers. And I have so many produce, bar, producers that want to start competing as baristas. And I spoke to them all the time in uh, conventions and uh, via Instagram message or WhatsApp. And I think that's a new, a new, a new part to be conquered and a new voice that I can have. And look, I, I agree with what specialty coffee Panama just text through big challenge, but you have what it takes. So <laughs> I think that's a beautiful way to kind of close uh, this. I, I'm sure you'll be able to, and, even if it's top six, where it's top three, where it's number one, uh, you get what it takes. You got that I love and passion and drive. The the difference between six and seven is huge. Yeah, the final it is. is yeah, final it is. Is, is a different scenario. Yeah. Yes, hundred percent. But look, um, I think we got left forty seven seconds or so. Um, Wilford, it's been such a pleasure. I really appreciate you. I hope your father is doing better. Um, because obviously it's uh, it's that's the most important part. Uh, you carry his name, and um, I think it's it's just beautiful how well connected all you are through coffee, through family, through soil, through trees, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you real soon uh, in real life in Melbourne for for the world. And like especially coffee panel, I said, I'm sure you you know you get there. You got what it takes. But thank, thank you for you, coming man. in, brother. I really appreciate you. Maybe. Maybe next time we'll do a we'll do a live stream. We could do a if you want a virtual tour of the farm. Could yeah, be cool. Yeah, of course. So yeah, yeah. Give a little bit more awareness. Maybe in a couple of months. How about that? Perfect. I love it. Let's do it. Bye. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Cuídate. Thank you Gracias. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. There you have it, guys. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, big shout out to Mancuso Coffee. Hey, Adrian. Uh, Ariel, Todd, uh, Elisa, all of them. Um, this is a strange time for us to do the live stream, but obviously time zone imposed the 9 a.m. where more people are at work. I'll try to push as many of these episodes out, uh, especially for my Melbourne people and my coffee people uh, stuck in lockdown. Uh, we're just going to try to bring more uh, coffee uh, 
you know, people in here so that we'll be able to entertain, keep the communication happening and uh, give some hope and love for the ones who need it most at these hard times. But yeah, thank you all guys.